Okay, and so now as, as we begin, I, uh, for those of you that are maybe here for the first time on a Monday night, we've been going through over the last several months, why study Hebrew roots? And we've been trying to lay a foundation. Uh, we have people, uh, well, who's here for the first time? Okay, some of you are here for the first time. Let's give them a big hand. We are glad you're here. Uh, but uh, we get well, like over a million hits on our website every month. I mean, in April, we had like a million six hundred thousand hits. We have over 40,000 people every month downloading the teachings from all over the world. Uh, and we have people from all over the world saying, help us start a Hebrew Roots congregation. We get all the time. We get emails from India, from South Africa, from everywhere. Uh, so it's just kind of exciting. Australia, I mean, you name it. Uh, we get phone calls from Kuwait. We get phone calls from Iraq. We get phone calls from everywhere. And so what we thought the best way to help would be to create information to help people start Hebrew Roots. Because those of you that are new to this or have been around a while, you know there's a lot of confusion. Okay, to start with, uh, we'll open with a word of prayer. Avinu, Malkinu, our Father, our King, we just love you so much, and we just thank you that we can all come together as one to learn your word, learn your language, and I pray, Father, you would give us eyes to see and hearts to understand and ears to hear. Uh, give us the mental acuity that's needed, Father, to take all of this in. But then, Father, also we want to be able to spread it. We want to be able to be uh, Talmudim, disciples, who go and spread your word, plant seeds all over. So we just thank you, and we just bless you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Okay, first off, where I want to begin is in Acts chapter 15, verse 19 through 21. Let me put the first PowerPoint up here. In Acts 15, 19 through 21, how many of you heard of uh, the book of James? You know James? Well, some of you may not know, but that wasn't his name. Okay, his name was Jacob. It really should be the book of Jacob. But with that said, in Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 19 through 21, uh, he's the one that's speaking about what are you going to do with all these Gentiles who are coming to faith. And he says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they do four things. Abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Now, I want to stop there for just a minute. I mean, many Christians will read this and say, okay, that's all that is necessary for salvation. Okay? Well, first off, how many of you know we're not saved by works? So if we're not saved by works, and you believe that this is what is necessary, you're saying you are saved by works. So first off, this had nothing to do with salvation. It wasn't a salvational issue at all. What it was, these are four things he was saying, look, just like in, in any congregation today, if you have someone who you know is a identity thief expert, he steals people's identity, and you know he does that, and he's coming to your congregation, okay, you may say, okay, you are welcome here, but you need to stop that. Is that fair? Okay. What they're saying here to the Gentiles, all these things were tied around uh, the uh, cults of the temple prostitutes and everything that was going on. And what these things were, these were the minimum requirements for fellowship. It had nothing to do with salvation. They were saying, look, you can come to a synagogue, but would you at least please stop visiting the temple prostitutes? Okay, how about that, guys? I mean, that's what they were saying. And if you'll notice, if you look at the very next sentence, he says, For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So what they were saying to the Gentiles is this. Look, we don't want to overwhelm you with all of this stuff. So for table fellowship, if we're going to sit down, I mean, how do you know relationships are built over meals? That's why business relationships are also often done in restaurants. Okay, well, they wanted to have relationships with Jews and Gentiles. And so, look, guys, if we're going to eat, there's some basic food laws, too, that would be really nice if you kept. Okay, and so this is the minimum for us to begin fellowshipping, uh, and, because guess what? You can come to the synagogue and you can learn all kinds of things over the year uh, that Moses is being taught. So that's what this is saying. But the other thing that this is saying that I think is so important is the wisdom that the apostles had. How many of you know sometimes you have Torah Nazis? Oh, yeah. Okay? And that can be a real problem, too. 
And so what they're saying here is, look, start slow. I mean, uh, start with milk and graduate to meat, but let people have their teeth before you start shoving meat down their throat. So anyway, I just wanted to give you that basic concept. But now let's go on to John chapter 2. Okay, what I have is a little sheepfold. What we're going to be talking about today is basically being grafted in. Uh, several weeks ago I talked about gra- being grafted in. This was the, the second half of that lesson. And in John chapter 10, verse 16, uh, Yeshua himself is speaking. And he says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there's going to be how many folds? And how many shepherds? Okay, so here sometimes... You can see the the little wolf is coming to get the sheep, and here's Yeshua at the door, and here's the sheep of Israel. Well, sometimes Gentiles feel like they're the sheep of the other fold, but they're looking in. Okay? And what the the Lord says, look, there's going to be one shepherd, and there's going to be one sheep, and everyone gets to be on the inside looking. And so you have Jews and Gentiles together, and there's one sheep and one fold. But notice the Gentile sheep came into the Israeli sheepfold. The Israeli sheep didn't go into a Gentile sheepfold. Now, look at Romans chapter 9, verse 3 through 5. Listen to what Rabbi Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, better known as, was saying. He says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Messiah for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain. Now look what, what pertains to the, the Jews. The adoption. How many of you believe we're adopted into the Messiah? Okay. Well, that also pertained to them. The adoption, the glory, the covenants, and that's in the plural, covenants. The giving of the Torah, the service of God, and what else? The promises. So who do the promises belong to? Israel. And we are grafted into that, okay? Now, a lot of Christians like to claim the promises, you know, like no weapon formed against you shall prosper. How many of you have heard people claim that? Okay, if you're grafted in, you can claim that. But you have to give it back, okay? In other words, you can't say it doesn't apply to Israel anymore. That's who it was spoken to. So it's okay to borrow them, but you've got to give them back. But these promises were all made to them. And then he goes on to say... Look at this, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Messiah came. So Messiah came for them, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. And then what do we find in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 8? He says, Now I say that Yeshua HaMashiach was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to do what? To confirm the promises made to the Father. Some people say he did away with the promises because the Jews killed my Jesus. Okay. But that's not what this is saying. He came purposely. How many of you knew that he was slain from the foundation of the world? How many of you think that the fact that he had to die on the cross, do you think that came as a big surprise to him? Oh, gee, now I've got to resurrect myself. Okay, this was all part of the plan. And so he came to confirm the promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And so what do we find? Let's go to this big old olive tree. This is a picture of an olive tree we took when we were in Gethsemane. And that's a big olive tree. <clears throat> and the reason why we're reading that is we're going to go back to Romans 11, verse 17 through 22. This is a verse that everyone is very familiar with. And what does he say? He says, as some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. And with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. He says, don't boast against the branches. If you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but what? The root supports you. Very important principle. You will say then, well, but the branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. He says, um, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith, so don't be haughty, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be what? Okay. So this really gives us a better perspective of our relationship to Israel. 
Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. How many of you are familiar? When I say Hebrews 11, what comes to your mind? The faith chapter. Okay. Well, I'm purposely starting in verse 17 through 22. Uh, uh, I mean, verse 32 through 40 of Hebrews 11. He says, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, notice that, does it say through works or through faith? Through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. It says they wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through what? Faith. Faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Who are they talking about? Jews. Jews, all from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, and they all had what? Faith. The Jews knew they were saved by grace through faith. Okay? And the, Hebrews 11 talks about all the Jews that had faith. These are people of the Jewish faith. Now I'm going to throw something else in here. Uh, and I have reasons for throwing this in here. Uh, sometimes I can be a little sarcastic. I try not to be. But... Let me, but I say this because there's some weird doctrines that are out there, and I like to kind of go after some weird doctrines sometimes. If uh, they, how many of you know these people were all of the Jewish faith? Because it's all the Old Testament, okay? Now, here's the thing. Was there a Issachar faith and a Zebulun faith and a Reuben faith and a Judah faith? Even if you were from Issachar or Zebulun, you were considered having a Jewish faith. Okay, so sometimes I'll say, for example, uh, someone from the tribe of Reuben was Jewish, and people will say, he's not Jewish, he's not from the tribe of Judah. Uh, look, when I say Jewish, I'm talking about their faith, not their genealogy. So uh, anyway, I just want to make a point there. Being grafted into the olive tree shows the equality also of the relationship between believing Jews and believing Gentiles, okay? They're all grafted into the same tree. So the church is not a separate tree, but finds its connection to the people of Israel firmly planted in Hebraic soil. So believing Jews are not grafted into a peach tree <laughs> called the church, okay? Believing Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. A wild olive branch is grafted into a natural olive tree. I think what's interesting, if you look at the Torah, Deuteronomy 22.9, God says, you're not to sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. And so God is not going to mix olives and peaches. Okay, what he does, he takes wild olive branches and puts them into a natural olive tree. And how many of you know a grafted in branch is not able to change the nature of the tree? It's not going to do it. Being grafted in, though, allows Gentiles to benefit from the covenants and from the promises. They inherit an active relationship with the land of Israel, the people of Israel, and the scriptures of Israel. So let's take a look at a very important uh, verses here. I mentioned them a little bit a couple of weeks ago, but I'm going to go a little bit more in detail. And this is from Ephesians chapter 2. Very important to highlight that whole chapter along with Romans 11. In Ephesians 2, the first three verses, it's talking about the relationship of Gentiles before they became believers. And it says, first off, we were dead. It says, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of what? Okay, so he's talking about the spirit of lawlessness, Torahlessness. There are people that are sons of disobedience, and that's what the Gentiles were. But now they are sons of obedience. He goes on to say, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature the children of wrath, just as the others. So that's kind of how people are before they get saved or become believers and act that way. And then what do we find in verse 8 through 10? And this is very important. It says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. Okay, so that's very important. And here at El Shaddai, we believe you're not saved by works. You are saved by grace through faith. And that, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Look at this, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So how many of you know it's not of works? But look at the next verse. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Okay, so we're not saved by works, but once you're saved, you got to get to work. All right? That, that is such an important concept. So many people struggle with this whole concept of grace and faith and works. They don't understand the order. It's trying to put the cart before the horse. You can't work your way into heaven, okay? You can't work your way into salvation. But once you're there, it's time to go to work. Okay, you are God's workmanship. I mean, if you were an employer, would you want someone who was just sitting around and not doing any work? I'll never forget, this is back in 78, 79. I was managing about seven uh, shoe stores. I was city manager, area supervisor of a bunch of shoe stores. And uh, I don't know how many of you were around in the 70s, but uh, there was a real big thing called Dress for Success. And uh, I had this employee that was working for me, and he thought he just had to come in a suit and tie and stand there and look beautiful. And it's like, I'm sorry, that's not going to cut it here. You need to go to work. Okay. Well, it's the same thing. Oftentimes we think when we get in the kingdom of God, all we have to do now is sit there and look beautiful or something. Uh, but God wants us to go to work. And matter of fact, it goes on to say, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So from the very beginning, God had planned on putting us to work. But here's the thing. He wants us to be in relationship with him before we go to work for him. That way we're going to do what he wants. How many of you ever had an employee that did what they want, not what you want? I mean, let's say you're managing a McDonald's and you tell the guy you, uh, you want him to flip burgers and he goes, oh, no, thank you. I really like landscaping. I want to go out and plant rose bushes. Okay, he's doing works, but it's what he wants to do, not what the boss wants him to do. Okay, so we have to find out what God wants us to do, not what we want to do. And so we find now in verse 11 through 16 of Ephesians 2, it says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, look at your condition. At that time you were without Messiah. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants, plural, not just the Mosaic Covenant, but the Abrahamic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, the New Covenant. And he says, and you had no hope without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been what? Boy, you don't know what the Hebrew word for bring near is? We're going to look at that here in just a minute. But when you... Uh, from a Hebrew mindset, when you hear this word brought near, something comes to your mind immediately that we're going to look at here in a minute. It says, well, you're brought near by the blood of Messiah. Okay? For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. He's broken down that middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Everyone goes, see, he did away with Torah. That's because it's a misinterpretation. I will give you the meaning. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the what? Does it say putting to death the law? What's put to death? The enmity. What does enmity mean? The hostility, the hatred, the antagonism. There was a lot of antagonism between Jews and Gentiles. And that's what he put a stop to, because how do you know, even in a marriage relationship, if you're very hostile toward each other, it's hard being one. 
Now, first off, if you think that this means that what he nailed to the cross was the Torah, look at this. It says, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, if you think that was the, the Torah, then what do you do with Matthew 5, 17 and 18 when Yeshua himself says, don't think I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So why would he say he didn't come to do it and it's not happening to take that verse and jump to the conclusion that that's what he did away with? Okay, so you can obviously tell that something's wrong with that picture. And I find when my theology doesn't line up, guess what has to change? My theology. Okay, if, if, if it doesn't line up with the scriptures, I don't try to make my theology fit in the scriptures. I kind of think, okay, I got another way I have to look at this. Just like when they were arguing about Yeshua's birth. Oh, he's supposed to be called a Nazarene. No, he's born in Bethlehem. No, he called a son out of Egypt. Well, they were all right. Okay, and so what you have to do is synthesize these different verses. When things seem to contradict each other, you try to find another verse that'll help tie these things together. In Acts 10, 28, here was the enmity. This is in Peter's vision of the sheet coming down. And he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation? That's not in the Bible. Okay. He says, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So that's basically the results of his vision. But the problem is that the oral Torah is what was forcing a separation and opposition to the written Torah. There was things in the oral Torah that were saying Jews and Gentiles, you know, can't mix. And so that's where the problem was. So what was, I believe, what was nailed to the cross was uh, the enmity, the hostility between Jews and Gentiles that was contained in a lot of those ordinances that were within the oral Torah, not the written Torah. Matter of fact, I don't know if you knew this, but it talks about the middle wall of partition Here's the temple. This is called the Soreg. It was this uh, little wall that was about three feet high or about one meter high that went around the temple. If a Gentile crossed it, they were dead. Matter of fact, here was a sign that was written in several different languages that said, you cross this barrier, you're dead. Okay, so, I mean, if you're, it was between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Israelites. Okay, now, I mean, you would think most people wanted everyone to worship their god, their pagan god, or whatever. But here, the, a lot of the religious Jews were saying, you can't have our god. You have to stay away. Okay, well, just like with any kid, the minute you tell them they can't do something, they want to do it. Okay, well, there was a lot of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, during, I have here that during the period of the Hasmoneans, okay, it's around Antiochus Epiphanes, 168 B.C., uh, the Greek invaders made 13 different breaches in the Soreg in opposition of this prohibition, not allowing Gentiles. But after the Hasmonean victory, uh, the sages partially repaired these damaged areas, but left small fences as a remembrance to the destruction. And they decreed that anyone walking past any of these rebuilt breaches should bow down and thank God for his salvation. But now here's what I want to point out. When it talks about brought near by the blood of Messiah, here is the Hebrew word brought near. And how is that pronounced? Can anybody read that? Korban. Korban. Okay. This is the kuf, the resh, the bait, and the noon, or the final noon. You see in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when anyone will offer a food offering, notice this is a food offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he will pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Well, here the word is korban, and it literally means to be brought near. So here it's translated as offering, but it means to be brought near the altar. It's a sacrificial present. And so the very idea of the blood of Messiah's sacrifice is what brought you near. When you read that word brought near in the New Testament, that takes you back to the sacrifices, the whole sacrificial system. But here's what's quite fascinating. And this is what Rabbi Daniel Lappin shared with me. Okay, so this isn't uh, any of my great insight. But if you disagree with me, you can take it up with him. <laughs> All right. In Exodus 9, 31, 
it talks about how the flax and the barley was smitten. Remember that during the plagues? Well, the Hebrew word for flax there is, uh, you can see the pe, sheen, tav, he, uh, pishte. But how many of you knew linen comes from flax? Okay, and the very word shows you that it refers to linen because linen comes from flax. Now, in Hebrew, Daniel Lappin said it's written like this, pishten, okay? Peshin tav nun. He said that's how, in the Hebrew language, that's how they write the word for flax, which is where you get linen from. Now, let's look at this for a minute. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, this is talking about Cain and Abel's offerings. It says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. Now, what do you think the Hebrew word for offering is here? It's not. It's minka. <laughs> but I'm going to bring, make a point here. Okay, there's different words for offering. It says, and then Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And guess what the Hebrew word for offering is this time? It's minka again. Okay? Now, if you look at the definition of minka, it means a donation, a tribute, specifically a sacrificial offering that's usually what? There is no blood, and it's voluntary. So in much of Christianity, they teach that Cain's offering was rejected because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. Well, guess what? Abel's wasn't a blood sacrifice either. It was a minka offering, which is generally bloodless. So what was it? What was the whole situation now between Cain and Abel? What happened? Well, what's very fascinating about this is you take the word Corbin, okay? This, what is this first letter? Kuf, okay, so let's write that out. There's Kuf, that's the final pay, it's still the pay. Here's the Resh, the bait, and the noon. Well, do you know what happened when you spelled the word to draw near? It forms the word for linen. So when you spell out the word Corbin, you look at the, each letter, the coop, the race, the bait, the noon, coming across, you get the same word that is for flax or linen. And so what he said was, that is the appropriate gift to bring. So Cain, there's nothing wrong necessarily with what Cain brought. But the problem was, he did not bring the best. He just went in the field, grabbed some flax, and here's the offering. What did Abel offer? He said, Abel offered the wool of the sheep. That's what he brought, the wool. And he brought the best of the wool. Okay, he didn't just bring any wool. He got the best lamb. He sheared the best lamb. He presented the best wool. And so what do you have? You have Abel offering the best wool in Cain offering linen, basically, what comes from flax, but it wasn't the best. And Rabbi Lappin said, this is why in the Torah you are not to wear wool and linen together because it reminds God of the sin of Cain and Abel. Kind of an interesting thought. You see in Deuteronomy 22, 11, don't wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Yes. Pardon me? What about the, fat? the fat means the best. There's like three or four different Hebrew words for fat. There's good fat, and how many of you know there's bad fat? <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this refers to the best. Yeah, so it, it wasn't referring to the fat of the animal, but it just meant the best, the best of the wool. Good question. Okay. And so what God really wants from the very beginning is unity between brothers, Right? He wants unity between the Cain and the Abel. He wants unity between Jew and Gentile, which is why I brought this up. And so in Ephesians 2.19, it says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And so what do we see? The, the Gentiles need to not feel like they are second-rate citizens in the sheepfold. They are fellow citizens in Ephesians 3, 6, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, were of the members of the same body, were partakers of his promise in Messiah by the gospel. 
What's interesting, the Hebrew word for relative is also derived from the same root where we get Corbin from. In other words, someone who's near to you, a relative. Okay, and guess what? We've been brought near, so that word brought near by the blood of Messiah also means, as far as relatives, we're close. Okay, we're family now. And so God says in Galatians 3.28, there is to be one new man. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this verse. It says there's neither Jew nor Greek. And everyone, see, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Well, let's read the rest of it. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, the last time I checked, there are still male and females. Okay, so guess what? There are still Jews and Greeks. What this is saying is not that they don't exist anymore, but the fact that we're all on the same playing field. Okay, we're all one. Now again, let's look at John chapter 10, 16. He says, there's other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they'll hear my voice, and, they, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You know, I'm reminded of something I did not share. So I'll share it again. It says, how many voices are there? And guess what? Yeshua's voice, what is he going to be speaking? Torah. That's what Yeshua speaks. What did he speak to combat the devil in the wilderness? Torah. Okay? The, the voice of Yeshua, he is the living Torah. And I tell you what, if the Torah was good enough defense armor for him, I think I'd use it too. In Ephesians 3, 3 through 6, it, look at this. It says, how that by revelation, Paul says, he has made known unto me the mystery. What is the mystery? As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of the Messiah, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And now, as we read this verse again, you understand that this verse is talking about the mystery, which is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Messiah by the gospel. So that is the mystery of the gospel. The good news is the fact that Jews and Gentiles are one. And so what do we find? Okay, this is the original division of the 12 tribes in Israel. I think you're going to find it's a little bit different division during the millennial reign. But this just gives you the, the idea. Look at Ezekiel 47, verse 21 through 23. This is during the millennial reign. They're going to divide the land of Israel according to the tribes of Israel. Did you see that? Does it say Israel is going to be divided between the Pentecostals, the Baptists, and the Catholics, and the Presbyterians? No, it is not. It is divided according to the tribes of Israel. And it will come to pass, you'll divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you and to who else? The strangers that sojourn among you. So there were going to be non-Jews, non-Israelites. And when I say non-Jews, I don't mean one of the lost tribes. I mean Gentiles, okay, uh, who are, have become believers. And it says, they're going to be dwelling among you, which will beget children among you. And they're going to be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. And they're going to have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it'll come to pass, then in whatever tribe the Savior sojourns, there shall you give him what? His inheritance, saith the Lord God. This is incredible. So let's look at Ezekiel 48, 31 through 35. This is the, the temple. And look at the gates. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Okay, you have a gate for Reuben, a gate for Judah, a gate for Levi, you know, uh, and then you have gates for Joseph and Benjamin and Dan. And on the south side, you've got gates for Simeon and Issachar and Zebulun. And the west side, you also have gates for Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. And it says the name of that city from that day on will be what? The Lord is there. So even entering the temple, there is not a Pentecostal gate, a Baptist gate, a Methodist gate, a Lutheran gate. The gates are after the tribes of Israel. And this, we're talking about the millennial reign here, guys. Ezekiel is looking far into the millennial reign, the messianic age. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter, this isn't on your notes, but in Revelation 21, verse 12, it talks about 
the heavenly city, and it talks about being again, the gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, how many of you know that right now, present day, we can't make that claim of citizenship and go to Israel? They're not going to let you in. Okay, so we're looking at the Messianic age. So, to conclude here, let's go to this last clip. This isn't on your notes either, and, uh, but you can kind of listen to the concept and make your own notes. What have we found is that the Torah instructed Israel in Deuteronomy 4, if you want to write this down, of their divine calling to reach the nations through living out the Torah in grace and righteousness. Deuteronomy 4, he says the nations are going to come to you and say, wow, what a great nation, what great laws, what great statues, what a fantastic God you serve. Now, do you think God had them do that so they could turn around and say, and you can't have any of these laws? No, they were to, the nations were to learn of these great laws. So the Torah instructed Israel of their divine calling to reach the nations with the Torah. Then, what do we have? We also saw in the prophets, especially Isaiah 56, who you can just reference, it predicted a time when the nations of the world would desire a relationship with the God of Israel and the people of Israel, living out the scriptures of Israel in Israel. This is what the prophets said, particularly Isaiah 56. Then we saw in the Gospels, in Matthew uh, 5, verse 28 in particular, in uh, verse 5, and in John 19, shows Yeshua telling the disciples to teach the Torah to the people of the earth, bringing everyone into one fold. John 19, there's to be one fold. There was to be one Torah, one teaching. Okay? And he says, go forth, teaching all nations, whatever I've told you. And what did he tell them in Matthew 5? I'm not doing away with the Torah. And then we looked in the epistles, and we see in Romans 11 and in Ephesians 2, what we just read, speaking of the believing remnant of the Jews who were now fulfilling their calling and bringing both Jew and Gentiles together through the light of the Messiah. And then finally, in the book of Revelation, as the Messianic age begins its opening chapter, what do we find? Jews and Gentiles finally together, and they're singing Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, you King of saints. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy. All nations, all nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. So we have exciting times that we're coming to when the gospel, which hasn't been totally fulfilled yet, will be, especially in the Messianic age. So let's stand. We'll close with prayer. Uh, we do have a table with all kinds of handouts if you want some handouts. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Those of you that are going to be staying for the Hebrew class, we're going to take like a five minute, maybe maximum 10 minute break. And then we'll get started with the intermediate Hebrew class. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah and for your word. And I pray, Lord, you would enlighten our eyes that we could really see plainly in your word what you're trying to accomplish and what our mission is so when we stand before you we can say truly mission accomplished thank you give everyone that's leaving now a safe ride home and those that are staying that they would have ears to hear in yeshua's name amen thank you very much thank you for studying with us today if you have any questions regarding the material discussed please contact me at my email address it's pastor mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.